Testing. Hey. Hi, guys. How are you guys? It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Do you know uh, whether you're in this building or you're at home or you're at work or you're out by the lake or out at the ocean, you're still in the house of the Lord. He's with you wherever you go. This is your temple. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit right here. Wherever you go, he's with you. Now, if you're not a believer, he's still wanting to be with you. Your sin's in the way. Actually, it's your recognition of your sin. He's already dealt with it. He just wants you to understand that, hey, you know what? You're not perfect. Anybody in here perfect? Have you guys ever been in a conversation? I've done this, especially with teenagers. But So I'm a te- teacher, right? I'm a band director. And I've had conversations with kids from time to time where we say, I, I say something like, hey, you know, the Bible says that you have to be perfect. Oh, well, I'm perfect. <laughs> what? You mean you've never done anything wrong? Yeah, I got that. I don't know what to say after that. I just, okay. I mean, what do you do with that? I don't know. I've, I've done too many things for me to be able to truth, truthfully say that I'm perfect. Um, before we get started, can we pray? Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for allowing us to come here and to open your word and to hear from you, the one true living God. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would guide us and lead us into all truth, that you would teach us, because you alone can teach us. We praise you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, I gave Tina like four pages of, of scriptures Hey, Tina, we don't have this one on here. It's the first one where I'm going to go. It's uh, Galatians chapter 5. Uh, we've, we've, I know this, this past Sunday that uh, Pastor Scotty, he moved on to a different topic. But for many weeks, uh, he was talking on Sundays about uh, walking in the spirit rather than walking in the flesh. And uh, I have... I went all, I told my wife, I think I I went down 10 different paths trying to come up with what it was that God wanted wanted me to talk to you about, and none of them worked, and we're back on, it's the same topic that Scotty was talking about. So some of this, a lot of this probably he's already talked about, but for whatever reason, that's where God led me back to. Um... So, in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16, he says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. And so, walking by the Spirit, number one, You can't walk by the Spirit if you don't got them, right? I wish that I had a big board here. I'm I'm not a preacher. I'm a teacher, okay? And if if I had a a, a whiteboard right here, I'd be drawing a big circle, and I'd be showing you what it is that you... It's a diagram that kind of explains what you look like, okay? So this is our earth suit, right? It's our flesh. It's our body. All right? It's what we are living in here on earth, but it's not who we are, right? And so inside this, we're living. And inside this, we are the soul, right? right? And so the soul is comprised of your mind. That's what you think with. And it has your emotions. That's what you feel with. And it has your will. That's what you choose with, right? Right? Your body, that's your flesh, it has your brain. Your brain is part of your flesh, right? Your brain is basically the storage for all of your knowledge that you gain 
or lose or forget, whatever, depending on, you know, I forget all things all the time. And then also inside here is your spirit. Now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your spirit is alive. It's alive because the Holy Spirit has given you life, and he lives in you, and he's the guarantee of our future hope, right? He's given us a little part of himself now so that one day we know that he's going to give us the rest of it, okay? Well, if you're not a believer, then that spirit part is dead, okay? So inside, okay, that, that was important, all right, for you to understand that. There's three parts. There's the body, the soul, and the spirit, and all three parts are different but coincide, right? Okay, all right, so when we talk about walking in the spirit, if you're not alive in the spirit, you can't walk in the spirit, right? You're only going to walk in the flesh. So if you see somebody out in the world doing something foolish and they're an unbeliever, well, that's exactly the way they're supposed to act, right? And for you to go up to them and say, hey, you know what? You shouldn't be acting that way. They're going to give you a look like, yeah, I am, because they are. But if you're a believer and you're out in, if you're out in the world and you see a believer acting a fool, well, that's not the way they're supposed to be acting. They're supposed to be walking by the Spirit. And so when you say, hey, man, you're not supposed to be doing that. I know. You're right. I know. Totally different, right? A different uh, reaction to sin. All right. So let's go to uh, Philippians a lot. Of, I told you I gave her four pages of Scripture. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Just a couple of pages over. Philippians chapter 2. Or you can look up at the screen if you don't want to flip. Starting in verse, uh, or it's verse 13. It says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Amen. And when you see that word will, that, that, that's like desire. So a lot of times we'll, tonight we'll see that word will. My will, I will to do this. That it, he's saying, hey, I desire to do this, right? So to me, that helps clarify that. So let's read that again using the word desire. So for it is God who works in you both to desire to do uh, both to desire and to do for his good pleasure, okay? Now, that word works, in the Greek, the Greek word is energeo, and it means to energize, okay? Think about the energizer bunny, right? Boom, 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 or, what, or yeah, he's the, the, the bass drum. Boom, 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 and what does he get his energy from? The battery, Right? You take the battery out, and he has no energy. He doesn't go anymore, right? Well, God, it is God who is energizing us both to desire and to do for his good pleasure, okay? In our bodies, in our existence, body, soul, and spirit, there are two different powers that are affecting our walk here on earth. One is this one right here, that God. God is energizing us, that power to do his good pleasure, okay? You go on to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6. It says, there are diversity of activities, but is the same God who works all in all, that same word. He is the one who energizes all in all. Later on in, in that same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, says, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills, as he desires. It's the Spirit. It's God working to do that, right? Uh, if you flip back to Galatians chapter 2, 
verse 8. It says, For he, God, who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised, also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. So you see here, God worked in Peter to be an apostle to the Jews while he worked in Peter, uh, in Paul, to go to the Gentiles, right? He's the one that energized Peter to go to the Jews. He's the one that energized Paul to go to the Gentiles. He was the driving force, right? It wasn't Peter. It wasn't Paul. It was God in them energizing them to do it, right? Right? If I'm up here and you guys learn anything, it's not because of me. It's because God energizes me to tell you, right? Before we even got here, I was at home and I was freaking out. I don't know why. I always freak out when I have to talk to adults, little kids, teenagers, whatever. I don't have a problem with it. But talking to adults, I get nervous. I get... I hate it, but I love teaching. I love teaching the Word of God, okay? That's because God energizes me to be a teacher, all right? If if you go on to uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 5, still in Galatians, it says, He who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you Does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? The Spirit works in us to do miracles. I was thinking about this. This isn't part of it. But I was thinking about uh, Jesus, right? And uh, did you know, like, the miracles didn't happen all the time? Right? That's why it was a miracle. You think about Jesus feeding the 5,000 from a few fish and a a couple of loaves of bread, right? That was a miracle. He didn't do that all the time. He actually had people providing for him, right? There was one lady that was, there was some ladies that that gave him money and the disciples. One of them was the wife of the steward of King Herod. King Herod, right? He has all the money. Well, his steward, the one in charge of all of his money, His wife was giving them money. If Jesus and his disciples on earth needed money from other people, needed to be provided for, because they didn't have jobs, they were going around proclaiming the gospel, right? Healing people, doing miracles. Well, if they needed that, don't you think Scotty needs it? Anyway, I don't know how I got on that. So, the, the work or the energizing that the Spirit does results in three spiritual fruits, okay? Three different types of spiritual fruit. First type is the attitudes, and that's what we find in Galatians chapter 5. Go back to chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. So, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against these, against such, there is no law. Right? That's the fruit of the Spirit. But that's just part of the fruit. The fruit right? Those are attitudes. There's other fruit. Remember, the fruit, that's, that's what the Spirit produces, right? That's not the Spirit. That's what the Spirit produces. That's what he grows. That's what he energizes people to do, right? Okay. Well, there's other things that he energizes people to do, all right? He he energizes people to uh, convert, to be a believer. Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Any any of you guys have these little tabs on your Bible? If you don't have tabs on your Bible, oh, it's the best invention ever. (laughs) Romans chapter 1, verse 13. 
This is Paul talking. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. He wanted some fruit from going to the Roman church, right? And going to Rome and converting people to Jesus. He wanted that fruit, okay? Uh, if you stay in Romans, you go over to chapter 16, we see another example of some fruit, of converts. Chapter 16, verse 5. It says, likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved, hold on, I wrote it down. Apinatus. Apinatus. Greet my beloved Apinatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Apinatus was Achaia's first fruit, right? Achaia was the one throwing the seed out and proclaiming, and Apinatus whatever his name is, he was the first one that was saved, right? That was a fruit, a convert, okay? But remember, it was the Holy Spirit who was energizing Achaia to win a Pientus, whatever his name is. Epi, we'll, go, we'll just call him Epi. All right, so that's two... So we got attitudes, we got converts, and then the third group is righteous actions. Still in Romans, go back to chapter 6. Verse 22 it says, But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. There's, a, there's a, a fruit of righteous, holy acting, right? Okay. Uh, go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Okay, so here we, we have an example of the Holy Spirit energizing the people of Philippi for righteous actions. It says in verse 14, Philippians 4, 14, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you, Philippians, know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your, your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. The, mass, the Philippian, Philippian church received fruit on their account because they gave, right? Yeah. Their giving was a righteous action. And because of their giving, then other fruit was able to grow from that, right? right. Okay. Um, okay, so that's one power that's on our life. The power of God or the Holy Spirit energizing us for good fruit, right? Okay. Well, there's a second power. That's the power of Satan, okay? The power of Satan. So if we go to Ephesians chapter 2. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, 
the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That word works, that's the same word, energeo, okay? Now we have a different energy. We have a different energy source. That's the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan, right? And he's working, he's energizing the sons of disobedience. Verse 3, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So we all were there. I was there, right? How long were you there? Depends on how long you lived before you were saved, right? That whole time, from the time you're born until the day you finally say, Jesus, I need help. Please save me. I'm a sinner, and I need you to save me. Until that point, that whole period of time, you're a son of disobedience, and the power of Satan is working on your life. Now, the Holy Spirit may be sending, energizing other people to come to you to try and win you, convert you, but he's not working in your life like he is a believer. Okay? That's all Satan. So you have this, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. So here's our second, our second power. All right? Go back to Galatians chapter 5. And we see some of the fruit of this other power. Verse 19. Chapter 5, verse 19. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a list of some of the things that Satan empowers people to do, the sons of disobedience. Okay. How many of you have been empowered to do any of those things while a believer? I mean, have you ever gotten mad at somebody unrighteously and you were a believer? Okay. Guys, have you ever committed adultery with someone in your heart as a believer? It happens. Okay. And I could go on. Sin still happens. So what in the world is going on? We have two different things now fighting us. We have two different spirits fighting us, right? We have this spirit that's working in the sons of disobedience but also works on us, trying to convince us to choose evil. And we also have the Holy Spirit trying to convince us to choose to act righteously. Okay, let's keep looking. Uh, well, so, and, and there's other places. I'm not going to go into those other places, but there's, there's lots of different fruit of both spirits, right? So this list of things, that's the, that's the fruit of that spirit of evil, basically. Okay? All right, so who did we say was energizing believers in a good way? The Holy Spirit. And what did we say that he produces? Good fruit, right? Okay. Go to Romans chapter 7. And remember, all of this has to do with trying to help us learn how to walk in the Spirit. Because I don't know about you guys, I for many, 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 many years heard preachers say, walk and read from the Bible. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. All right, yes, all right. How do I do it? 
Well, you just walk in the Spirit. All right. How? Well, don't walk in the flesh, and you'll be walking in the Spirit, and then you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. <laughs> All right. How? I never got an answer. But I got an answer, but it took me a long time. Okay? And just because I have the answer doesn't mean that I practice that answer all the time. I have practiced it, just not consistently. Right? What's the difference between a little league baseball player and a major league baseball? No, no, no. What's the difference between a minor league baseball player and a major league baseball player? What's the difference? Consistency. A minor league baseball player can, get, can hit a home run. A major league baseball player hits a home run more often, right? That's why they're in the majors and the other kids in the minors, okay? It's consistency. So are you a major league believer or are you a minor league believer? Uh, I'd probably still be in the minor leagues. I think so, all right? I know how to walk in the spirit. I just don't do it consistently, okay? But I'm trying to, take, to teach you this is how you walk in the spirit. So, and you may already know, and I hope you do, and I hope this is, like, completely boring you to death. That would be great. All right, so we're in Romans chapter 7, <laughs> verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. We talked about the Holy Spirit was bearing fruit, good fruit, okay? Now we have some bad fruit. This bad fruit leads us to death, right? And who is producing this bad fruit? Well, for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions. So what kind of passions was it? Sinful passions. Okay, so let's look at a different place. Still in Romans 7. Go down to verse 8. It says, But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Taking that verse, is sin being used as a verb or a noun? What's, what's a verb? Action. What's a noun? Person, place, and, or thing, or idea. Okay. I hadn't heard that one. All right. I only knew person, place, and thing. All right. She's, she's way better than me. Okay. So in this verse 8, is sin being used as a noun or a verb? Let's read it again. <laughs> but sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, Produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. It's a noun. A verb can't be alive, right? A verb, it, it, yeah, it's a noun. The noun <laughs> took the opportunity, right? A person can take an opportunity to produce something, right? But, you know, wait. So... What? Producing is the verb. Producing is the verb. Is the verb. Right. But sin is the noun doing the verbs, right? Okay. Uh, let's keep going. Verse 9. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. What is that? What is sin? Noun or verb? Still a noun. Verse 10. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. So, there we've got five verses talking about sin as a noun, right? How many of you have, have always heard that sin is missing the mark? It's something you do that you shouldn't have done or not doing something that you should have done, right? It's a verb. But here it's talking in, about a sin being a noun. If you go back all the way to, to Genesis, you see that sin is waiting at the door to devour Cain, 
after Cain killed Abel, right? God warned him. He said, hey, you just do right and you'll be all right. But right now, sin's waiting to devour you, man. Well, he didn't listen and he killed Abel. Came alive. And then it killed Cain because he sinned. So, This sin is in us. Okay? Let's, get, let's keep looking. Still in Romans 7, go down to verse 19. We're, we're still thinking about this as a noun. Verse 19, for the good that I will to do. Okay, so we're going to change that will to desire. Okay? To me, it just is easier to understand. For the good that I desire to do, I do not do. But the evil I desire not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I desire not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, hold on a second. That does not say that when you go sin, it's sin that does it and not you. You're the one that made the choice. Okay? It is saying that sin for a believer is the one that put that thought in your brain to do that. Okay? Remember at the very beginning, we talked about our, our, who we are, body, soul, and spirit, right? The body has the brain. Our body is made of flesh, right? And this flesh is made of the dust of the earth, right? When Adam sinned, the sin entered the world. Well, we're part of the world. So when Adam sinned, sin entered mankind, and as for it will forever be, right? So sin is living, dwelling inside this earth suit with you, the soul and the spirit. And sin, anytime it can, puts these thoughts in your mind. It uses the brain and it puts these thoughts in your mind, right? And they're bad thoughts. They're uh, temptations to do evil. They are, uh, well, sinful thoughts, right? But it sounds like you. So when I have a sinful thought that comes into my mind, it sounds like Jeff Wilson from Longview, Texas, okay? But it's not me. It's sin who's living with me. Yeah. How do I know? Well, we'll get there. Okay. Where did we get to? Got to 20. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 21. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who desires to do good. Okay? I'm the one that desires to do good because I am alive with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit and I, we want to do good. Right? But remember Jesus told Peter, he said, hey, Peter, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? The spirit is willing. He's alive. I'm alive with the spirit. Woo, yeah, I can do it all. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. True, but sin's over here tempting me not to, right? And he lives in this body with me. But at that, is it? Yeah. okay. Verse 22, for I, the spirit, Delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, the, the body again, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. There's a war going on, right? Spirit, good. Flesh, bad. But why is the flesh bad? It's because sin that lives in the flesh right? The flesh by itself is not bad. It was designed to be good, but because Adam sinned, sin came in and started living in the flesh, and so that made it bad, okay? Now, the good news is that sin is condemned to the body. That's why when the body dies, you don't have to worry about sin anymore, because when the body dies, the sin that lives in the body dies too, and so your spirit now is free, 
right? That's why in the next verse it says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? This body, this flesh thing has death in it, sinful death. Who's going to free me, the spirit, from this body of death? Understand? And there's a really gross Roman thing that goes along with that too. And it's really cool, but I'm not going to go into that. Okay. So, all right. So we can basically see that sin is like Satan's secret agent. Okay? Satan can tempt people to do evil, right? But he can only be in one place at one time. So instead of him, most of the time, instead of him tempting us, it's sin who lives in us, right? He's doing the will of his master, which is Satan. Sin is tempting us to do evil. Well, at the same time, there's another power. And we... we, we said it was God and the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. But they, the, the Bible uses another word. If I can change my page. Uses another word for that same power. Go to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. If you go back from Matthew, it's Ma- Well, just keep going back. Two books back from Matthew. Zechariah chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Now, Zechariah is talking, he's talking to uh, this guy, his name is Zerubbabel. He was not the king, but he was kind of in charge of the Israelites after they left Babylon, their captivity in Babylon. They got to leave, and they got to go and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, right? Well, this guy, Zerubbabel, he was... He was kind of in charge of that. And so Zechariah, he is uh, speaking for God to Zerubbabel. Starting in verse 6. Here we go. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by, pow- not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Ye- Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Okay, so Zerubbabel, he's gone back and he's trying to rebuild this temple, right? Only there's all kinds of people who are on the outside trying to keep him from rebuilding that temple. Okay, lots of obstacles. That's the mountain, right? Well, Jesus, uh, the the Holy Spirit is telling him, hey, you know what? You're going to go back and you're going to do this. You're going to rebuild this temple, only it's not you. It's the Holy Spirit who's going to do it. And at the end, when you put the capstone, when you put the the last thing on top, you're going to say, grace, grace to it. Grace did it, not me. Right? Grace is the word that is used kind of like Sin is, okay? So sin is the secret agent of Satan. Grace is like the secret agent of God. Grace is the power that energizes the believer to do for his good pleasure. Sometimes in the Bible you see it says it's God that does it or the Holy Spirit, but a lot of times it says grace. And actually if you go in through the the Old Testament, most of the time that word is translated favor. So think of it as the favor, of the unmerited favor of God that blesses you, Amen. right? So uh, okay. So I'm going to skip a few things. Run out of time. Um, all right. So. How do we access the grace, right? We're trying to walk through the Spirit. The power of the Spirit is God's grace, right? How do we access it? 
How do we access it so that we can walk in it? Because you can live in the spirit. If you are a believer, you are living in the spirit. You are alive in the body, in the soul, and in the spirit. If you're not a believer, you're alive in the body, you're alive in the soul, and you're dead in the spirit. Okay? But if you're a believer, you're alive. So how now can we walk in it What now that we're living in it? Because remember, all those years before you became a believer, you lived as an unbeliever. You lived as a son of disobedience, a, a son of disobedience. Yeah, I said the same thing. And the habits that you formed are still with you, yeah. right? You've, you've, how many of you are right-handed? Okay, how many of you brush your teeth with your right hand? Okay, and if you're left-handed, how many of you brush your teeth with your left hand? Okay, go home tonight and try using the other hand. I, <laughs> I think so too. It's because it's a habit, right? That's my strong hand, my strong arm. I brush my teeth with my right hand. That doesn't mean I can't do it. I just, it's going to look really weird and I'm going to get stuff in my ear, like Jesse said, all right? Because I, it's, I'm not used to it, right? Let's experiment. All right, we're, we're going to clap. Everybody just clap. Ready, set, go. Okay, which hand is on top? Turn it over. Clap again. Doesn't that feel weird? Okay, because you're not used to it. There's one way that you always clap, and if you do it the other way, it's just wrong. Right? Well, you're living your life before Jesus, and you create habits. And then you find Jesus and you become alive in the spirit and now you're trying to change those habits. And it's hard. It just feels wrong. But it's right. And so we got to walk in the right and, and change our habits. Right? That's why if you were in the, in the Sunday school the other day, my name is Jeff. I'm a believer. I'm a saint who sometimes sins, right? My sin isn't who I am, okay? I'm a believer. I am alive with Christ. I am a saint. But I sometimes sin, okay? And so the rest of the, our life is not about trying to keep ourselves saved or to get re-saved or to get more of the Holy Spirit. And it's not about that. It's about trying to change our old stupid habits, yeah. trying to change our behavior to line up with who we are. Because who I am has an... What I do is not who I am, but who I am has an impact on what I do. If I am an unbeliever, I'm only going to walk in, the sin, in sin because that's all I know. And that's all I'm going to know. If I'm a believer, sometimes I'll walk over there, but it's because of my habits. And it's because of sin in me influencing me, right? So we have to decide, we have to choose. When a thought gets put into our mind, we have to choose, is this sinful thought or is this Holy Spirit thought? How do we know? The number one way, the Word. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it's not from God. Amen. His Word doesn't change. It's to, the same today as it was yesterday, and it will forever be, right? So you have to discern good and evil. And the only way you can discern good and evil is if you know what is good. The only way you can know what is good is through learning this, right? But just knowing that isn't enough, okay? The Pharisees, they knew a whole lot of Bible, but they still weren't able to discern right and wrong because they killed Jesus. You still need that power, that Energizing power. Go to Hebrews chapter 
4. Hebrews chapter 4. Not everybody can get grace, that power. God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. You want to tap into God's power? This is it right here. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in, to help in time of need. Where is the throne of grace? Where is the throne of grace? It's in heaven, right? That's where God is. That's where Jesus is. That's where the throne of grace is. How can we boldly go to that throne of grace? Does that mean we got to die? Prayer. Through prayer. Exactly. Well, who says that, I mean, how do I know that, that God's really going to help me if I go to him in prayer? Well, number one, he said it right there. But number two, you got to have faith, right? You, go, you stay in Hebrews and you go over to chapter 11. Verse 6, he says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you're going to go to him, you got to have faith that he's going to bless you. Okay? You need some help? You got to believe that if you go to him, he's going to help you. And then he will. Guys, I can't tell you how many times he has helped me. I have gone to him. I have humbled myself and said, God, I need help. I ain't got this. It's the times that I don't. Oh, I got this. Oh, this is something small. I got this. No. That's my pride. That's when I fall. It's all about being humble, humbling yourself, recognizing that you need help, right? The, the story about the little child, Jesus brought in the little child and he said, hey guys, you want to be the best? You got to become like this little child. And that little child's the little toddler, right? And the toddler, I've uh, you guys probably heard this before, but the toddler, right? You think about a toddler. They're old enough to walk, they can say a few words, but if you leave them by themselves, they're going to die because they can't cook, they can't clean themselves, they can't get clothes. They can do some things, but most of the stuff they can't. They need mama and daddy to help them, right? We have to become like the little child. We have to understand we're just a little toddler and can't do it. We need help from God. God wants you to come to him for help all the time. He loves showing off. But if you don't come to him, he ain't going to do it. You guys know the, the story about Jesus walking on the water, right? And he had Peter come out to him, right? And it, in this big storm, well, he remember, he, he sent him out. He said, hey, go on across this, and I'll meet you over there. He didn't say, I'll meet you over there. But he said, hey, go on. And... They're going and they're struggling. They're trying to get across and there's ways, whatever. And then they see this figure, it's Jesus. They don't know it's Jesus right away. And he's walking. And if you look at Mark, it says he was walking like he was just going to keep on going. He was going to walk right on by. But they cried out. And so he stopped. And he came over. He had Peter come out. Oh, you little faith. And he got in the boat and calmed the storm. If they hadn't cried out, he wouldn't have stopped. Right? Oh, you got this. I'll just keep on going. He wants us to go out, cry out to him for, for help. And that's, yeah, that's all I have tonight. Guys, it's so easy, but it's so hard. It's so hard to be humble. To humble yourself, to recognize that you need help. God, I need help driving home tonight. Can you help me? God, I need help getting up in the morning with a good attitude. 
I can't do it. You have to do it for me. God, I, my kids are driving me nuts. I can't, I can't, I can't be nice to them. You're going to have to help me. <laughs> Whatever. Okay? He will, and he, I, I have never once asked God for help in my time of need and have him not help me. Not once. But I have had him not help me when I was too stubborn to ask. Or I allowed Satan or the power of sin to deceive me into thinking, into not recognizing that I needed that help. Because he's good at that. He's real good at disguising, oh, this, is, this looks good. You get, you get mesmerized, right, by this shiny thing over here, and you, you forget that, oh, that shiny thing's bad. Okay. <laughs>